Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paolo Barlera. I'm the interim director of the Italian Cultural Institute in New York. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the second webinar did, organized by the Italian Cultural Institutes of North America, United States and Canada, uh, to uh, Raffaello, Raphael, and uh, the 500th anniversary <coughs> from uh, his death and all the celebrations that are taking place in Italy and abroad. And let me first of all thank um, my colleagues, uh, Valeria Rumori in Los Angeles, Anna Maria Di Giorgio in San Francisco, Luca Di Vito in Chicago, Emanuele Amendola in Washington, D.C., Francesco Darelli in Montreal, and Alessandro Ruggera in Toronto. Um, Today, we're going to talk about uh, Raphael's frescoes and uh, in particular, several aspects that come to light in uh, the perspective of scientific study of artworks and cultural products uh, across the board. Um, to do that, we have with us, we're very honored uh, to have with us Marco Leona, who is head of the uh, scientific research department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and Antonio Sgamellotti, who is a um, member of the Accademia dei Lincei and professor emeritus at the University of Perugia, and many other things which will be too long here to mention. Um, we were supposed to have with us also Virginia Lapenta, who's the uh, chief conservator at Villa Farnesina, but unfortunately, um, because of unexpected and, and uh, personal emergencies, she cannot join us today. We hope perhaps that in the future we could do something with her. Um, before we start, let me, remind, let me remind all of you that at the end we will take uh, a few questions, so if you want to ask them, <coughs> you have to write them in the um, uh, chat uh, box of the Zoom platform that you see at the bottom, in the, in the bottom um, uh, strip of your application. Uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome to the webinar and thank you for joining us. Um, Marco is in New York and um, Antonio in from Italy. Um, uh, let's begin with uh, contextualizing uh, Villa Farnesina and, and Raphael in, Raffaello in, in Villa Farnesina. First of all, well, can you tell us a little bit about Villa Farnesina? What it is, where is it, and, and why is it important in Raphael's uh, career? Who wants to well, I, start? Well, Paul, I want to. I want to just like interject, um, mm -hmm. being just a scientist and not mm -hmm. uh, not an art expert. But I want to uh, give a little bit of the color of Villa Farnesina because Villa Farnesina is a beautiful monument. It's a special place in a very special part of Rome, and and I think that many of our uh, listener and web participants know Trastevere. But uh, Villa Farnesina, in a sense, it's, 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 it's in the heart of Trastevere. It's in the part of Trastevere that people may not necessarily see um, going to the uh, night spots and, uh, and the hangout places. It's, uh, it's, it, would have, it would have been the Garden of Rome. It's the place where somebody would have built, as we'll see, uh, their countryside villa. Um, it's also a very special place because you're... In, in, in a way that's very typical of Rome, you go from high and low. You can find your very traditional Roman trattoria where you can have the amazing uh, dishes of the Cucina di Trastevere. And Antonio knows well what I'm talking about because it's a place that he made me discover. But uh, Villa Farnesina is across from the Accademia dei Lincei, which is the Italian National Academy. It's, that's the highest... Uh, uh, congregation of academics, uh, literates, uh, scientists. So it's, it's a very, very special place. And um, if you happen to participate in the programs that they do in the symposia, you may 
stay there both for the day during the working and, and at night. And when you wake up, like I did in the room that uh, Antonio gave me in the, in the residence for scholar, you open your windows and you look over to Villa Farnesina. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a beautiful experience. And one that I recommend to everybody, uh, Italians, uh, Americans, uh, tourists, um, it, it's just a place that uh, it, it's too hard um, to to describe. Uh, but I think that Antonio will do that for us, both in history, we'll see it maybe where how it was, and and today. So I just like want to leave it to Antonio now, who's uh, really steeped into the history and the beauty of Villa Farnesina. Thank you, and good afternoon to everybody. This is the entrance in the old time of Villa Farnesina, which is on the south side. Nowadays, the main entrance is on the north side. This is the today south north side of the villa. In the old time, it was an open loggia. You see there were no windows for more than 140 years, which as you can imagine, was not the right environment for the conservation of the affresco. This is the loggia nowadays. And in the old time, at the time of Raphael, the loggia, the sky of the loggia was very, very blue due to azurite. Nowadays, it's not anymore so, and I, I shall explain the reason why this happened during the time. But in Villa Farnesina, in the ground floor, apart from the loggia of Cupid and Psyche, there is another very beautiful loggia, loggia of Galatea. This is the loggia of Galatea. You see with a beautiful uh, uh, a fresco by Sebastiano del Piombo and by Raphael as well. And this is the, the villa, the loggia of uh, Galatea, which is uh, just next to the loggia of uh, Cupid and Psyche that we are going to describe today. The, uh, the loggia of uh, Cupid and Psyche is uh, very important from the expression of Raphael idea of a new concept of decoration in relation to the architecture. He realized a perfect osmosis and continuity between the exterior, the garden, and the interior, the open loggia and the pergola. There are beautiful picture elements which characterize the decoration of the loggia that I am going to describe using the digital loggia, as you will see in a few seconds. So, there are vegetal festoons, you see, very beautiful, containing more than 170 fruits and vegetables coming from all over the world. It's a, a kind of a biodiversity coming from all the continents known at that time. You must know that there are also vegetables coming from Mexico. This is just 20 years after the discovery of the new world. There are two large fictive tapestries on the top of the vault. You can see, I can large a little, as you can see quite well. One is the Council of the God from Olympus, and the other one is the wedding banquet. These are on the top of the vault, very large, long, almost half of the size of the lodge. And then there are 10 pendentives just in the band immediately below the tapestries with the 10 episodes of the fable of 
cupid in psyche is taken from the Apuleius Metamorphosis. The fabula tells the story of the love of the god Cupid, who was immortal, of course, and with a, with a beautiful girl, Psyche, which was, of course, mortal. And that love was very hindered by the Venus, the mother of Cupid. This love story resembles very similar to the story of Agostino Tigi and, and uh, Francesca Ederassi, who was a courtesan from Venice, very beautiful, but coming from the Pope. So the love was hindered by the Pope, Julius II, but eventually the story had a happy end and they got married in the Villa Farnesina as well. There are, I, I want to show the 10 episodes. This is uh, Cupid and Venus. This is uh, Cupid with uh, three graces. This is uh, Venus, Ceres, and jo Jonah. Then is Venus on her chariot, then Venus and Jupiter, Mercury the Herald, Psyche taking to the heavens, Venus and Psyche, Jupiter and Cupid, and eventually Mercury and Psy. They are the celestial episodes because in, in the plan of Raphael, there was also the description of the episode which occurs in the, in the earth, in, in the under earth, but they were never painted. There was space in the wall, in the lunette that you can see over here, to paint those. But that was interrupted very soon. In fact, we have a very few sketch of this episode, while we had many sketch and drawing of the episode on the sky. Uh, the loggia is a, a very extraordinary example of how the Raphael work, workshop was working. The master Raphael himself conceived and designed the architecture of the festivals and, and also the, uh, the, the, the figurative saying. But he entrusted his collaborator, and the main collaborator were Giovanni da Udin, as far as the earth, the, the, the vegetable, and Giulio Romano and Giovanni Francesco Penni for the uh, figurative sense. So, this is a perfect synergy among the artist, guide, and control by an attentive and vigilant director, Raphael Insen. The organization of the workshop may be firstly inferred by the study of the journata. I remind that the giornata is uh, uh, the, the piece of uh, the piece of uh, of uh, last pl plaster that is wet, prepared wet to be painted during the day while the plaster was still wet. The, the giornate of the loggia are 305. Uh, 22 for the council and 23 for the wedding banquet. So there are so many. But the festoons, the vegetal festoons, which is a, the work by Giovanni da Udine, 
were painted festive. This in, the reason was to subdivide the space for the figurative sense to be painted later. But there is a, a detail that is quite interesting. Uh, prior of the execution of the festoons, a central black band was painted into the last plaster. And the reason was to bring out the colors of the fruits and the vegetables. The su subdivision of the space is a, a very important feature of the project foreseen by Raphael. And it had two practical reasons. The preliminary execution of the basic grid to separate the surface of the seeds were conceived to facilitate the resistance of several painters on the scaffold to work on different parts of the world. And furthermore, to have an exact measure of the surface to prepare the cartoon in scale one to one. From this cartoon, the drawing is then transposed into the plaster by using mainly the punching technique and the details, for instance, in the incarnations, and by direct incision in the driver. Probably a unique scaffold was used, as long as the size of the loggia. For sure, at least it was long as half of the vault, since uh, this is confirmed by the two long giornate which define the edges, these edges of the tapestry on the vault. The recurrence of certain partial fissure in the slant of the angle in certain case, not always corresponding to the, the individual which appear in different scenes, testify the use of models by Raphael's workshop in the cartoons. An expedient which confer a great of cohesion to the composition executed, of course, by several hands. We can see some of this just in the digital logic. For instance, you see this, uh, you see these two faces, Venus faces, in this, the faces of John, they are similar. The opposite, but the cartoon is the same. So also on the, on the tapestry, you, you see, for instance, this is a, this is a, this is a Mercury, and this is Mars, but as you can see easily, they are, they are obtained using the same cartoons. And the same also on these three figures. You see this is a Cupid, this is Apollo, and this is a, a Dea, a goddess next to Hercules. And the heads are the same, exactly the same again using the same cartoons. But it's quite interesting to know that some of the cartoons used in the loggia of Cubit and Psyche were used also in the Parnassus, in the Stanze della Signatura in Vatican, executed more than five years before to the loggia. This is a clear evidence that Raphael had at his personal disposal repertoire of types that he could draw even on distance of se several years. We say that uh, there was a very careful planning. There are 300, 
by giornate, but there are no any painting in here. So Raffaello didn't scrape part of the uh, plaster to renew the image. There are just two small things that appear, and I will show you. For instance, in this, you see there is a, a small painting on the air of Venus, which was covered by Azurai when in the restoration of 1930, the Azurai was stepped out, this painting clearly appeared. The second painting, which is not a painting, is just a an adjustment of the air of the stairs. There is, as you can see by using fluorescence, X-ray mapping, that there was a more air in the crown of the godness. So two small pentimenti, rather than pentimenti, I would call them adjustments, are the evidence that the plan of the fresco was very well done by Raphael and executed by his uh, school. I will stop here and yes. I will come Antonio. back later on. Antonio, Sorry for the improvements, but now I think everything seems to go okay. Antonio, let me ask you two quick questions. Um, uh, can you give us a, a, an idea of the size of, of the workshop? How many people were working there? <coughs> it's, it's very difficult to say because he was at that, at that time working also in Vatica. He, he had a, a very good organization. The main uh, collabor collaborator were Giulio Romano, that after he, he went to Mantua and he painted the the well-known uh, 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 Cupid and Psyche in Palazzo Te in Mantua, painting not just the celestials, the, 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 the events episode, but also the Terrestrians one, that is very complete. And then Giovanni da Udine, that was working, shifting. I will show some images later on, navigating. He was working on some fruits, on, on Villa Farnesina in, in the same year, in the same days, was working in the loggia of Raphael in Vatican. And then Giulio Romano, eh, Pierin Dalvaga, and these are the main, but the exact number, he, he had a, we don't know. a lot of people working for him, but the, those were the main. And they were important because they were contributing not just on the scaffold, but they contribute also to the cartoon. For instance, for instance, some of the sketch are by hand of Raphael, but then we were enlarged and reported in the scale one-to-one -one by the co-worker. And the other quick question is, how long did it take from beginning to end? Do we know? Le less, than, less than two years. Okay. Much less, which is a very small time. I mean, there yeah. are three, 305 uh, giornate, which means quite a lot. But they, they were quite well organized. The idea to divide, divide the space by that kind of grid through the festings was a very brilliant idea because they had the entire, entire, entire composition, composition on their hands. If you want now, we can navigate on the fruits. Uh, in no. now, Antonio, I, I just want to tell you, I shared with the participant the uh, website uh, from the Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche where the, the, the you're navigating. So they, they can, I think they can um, navigate then at leisure uh, or, or even follow you and, and then explore back. Yeah. But maybe no, do you is, want to say something about the, the digital, uh, the digitization yes. project? Yeah, uh, I, I would like to show some 
details which are quite interesting in, in a way. So I go back to the digital and navigate into the, first of all, in the, into the festoons on the fruits, because they are quite interesting, as you can see. So while we wait for, for Antonio to come back, um, I'm going to ask Marco about uh, scientific, scientific research as yeah. it is applied to frescoes. Yeah, yeah, and, case and of, I'm, I'm, of Raphael. Yes, um, Paolo. So I'm, I, I'm also picking some questions on the on the chat, and there's an interesting one. So I want to pick on on uh, on the description that Antonio did, right? And maybe I say things that are obvious to some, but maybe not to others. Uh, when you when you paint fresco, um, the painter actually creates the image um, not by mixing separately uh, a paint, so the pigment, which is the colored material, and the binder, which is the, which is the vehicle, the oil, the acrylic, whatever, um, or the tempera. You paint directly on the plaster that is just applied. It's a very fine plaster, it's, it, and the plaster is, in a sense, uh, alive, chemically active. It, uh, it's, it's material that absorbs CO2 from the air, and creates calcium carbonate there, which is um, a very stable mineral. So as you paint into these uh, wet plaster with, with the choice of mineral pigments that they were using, the pigment remains embedded in the plaster and, and you have a material that is extremely stable. Um, that's why we see the frescoes uh, still today, even though at some point in their life for quite a few uh, centuries actually were exposed to the environment. Um, that process requires the plaster to be uh, freshly applied, as I say, and still wet, so reactive, reactive with the atmosphere. That's the giornata. The giornata is the amount of wall that you would plaster knowing how fast you are going to paint. So you have to think about the, the technology um, and, and how really technically and, and even business minded the painter was. They knew that to to reach a certain uh, level of, um, of fineness, they could paint slow, which means making a small uh, giornata, a day of work, or they could paint quickly and allowing them to cover a lot of wool in, in one day. Um, so somebody asked, why was it two years uh, if you have 300 giornate? I'm, I'm going to say it bluntly, but one of the things like, you know, Remember that what they also had to do was take up and down the scaffolding because this loggia is what, six meter tall. So you really have to create a system where you're able to go up and paint on the wall. Um, you have to transfer the drawing. So the, the drawing was transferred, and Antonio mentioned it, with this polvero, which you use the cartone, which is a one-to-one -one drawing uh, of the image that Marco. you will apply to the wall. Yes, Antonio. Antonio. Can we, you still, see me now? we still don't see the screen. And so all of these phases are what builds up to the, um, the, you know, the two years versus 300 giornate. So it's, it's a lot of uh, preparation work. And as Antonio mentioned, made more complicated by the fact that he was really trying to have a lot of people painting at the same time and cover the more um, ground. So in the... In the festoons, uh, we chose 21 fruits according to the 10 different colors and fruits coming from all over the world. Just a second. So, for instance, for the red, we have the pomegranate coming from Iran. And if you just click on the uh, informative red uh, spot, you can have uh, open a window with some information, botanic information, some different uh, images. For instance, this is pomegranate in another festoons, and then this is an illustration from the commentary of the 16th century. This is a pomegranate from a ground stone from Festum, and this is a uh, the same uh, uh, fruits coming from a fresco of a villa. 
then for the red, there is apples, there is cherries coming from uh, Turkey. And then for the uh, uh, orange, you have uh, this beautiful large musky pumpkin coming from Mexico. And then there is a melon coming from India. And this uh, sour orange coming from uh, Extreme Orient, Japan, and China. Then for the yellow, you have wet. You have another Mexican vegetable, which is maize, typical from Mexico. And in a way, this is the best documentation in Europe of the vegetable coming from the, from the new world. And so on. There is quinces for the yellow. And then for the green, you have watermelon. You have this, this fruit, which is alone. And then again, you have something coming from Mexico, zucchini, which in English is courgette. And you can see nice images on another part of the loggia in a different festoon. And this is coming from the loggia in Vatican. As I said, Giovanni da Udine was commuting from Villa Farnesina into the Vatican. And then we can go on. For the blue, you have plums. For the violet, you have grapes. And grapes are very well illustrated in the, in the loggia. This is a bunch of red grapes, but there is also a bunch of white grapes. And then this is an illustration from the commentary of the 16th century. And this is grape in the Luxor, 15th century before Christ. And this is grapes from a villa in Pompeii. And so on, for pink, you have peaches, and then you have the brown, which is the common medlar. Then you have sorghum, again for brown. Then you have for, for black, the water chestnut, and for a while, you have the cabbage. So, I mean, all the 10 important colors are, are representative by some fruit and vegetable. Let's go now to the, to the animals, which are quite interesting. All the animals are painted in the, in the village. In the, in, in, there are 50 animals. Most of them are birds. Of course, birds, because the environment of the episode is the sky, so the natural animal is bird. But they are so well, for instance, this is an Italian sparrow. You see, you can see this is the Italian sparrow male. This is the female. And then if you go to the actual sparrow, you see that you can recognize that the top one is a male and the down one is a female. They are represented so well that it's almost possible to see which one is the... Let's go now to some other. You see, this is an eagle. But you can recognize which kind of eagle is it. It's a Bonelli eagle. If you enlarge it, you can see easily that it's an eagle belonging to the Bonelli species. All the blue informative points represent birds. As you can see, most of those are birds. This is, for instance, is a Cerberus, because there are also five mythological 
animals in the represented. And then this is a bats. This is a, a different kind. And you can see that it's a bat. I mean, if you enlarge it, you can see easily that this is a, a mouse flying. It's a mammal. And there are just two mammals in all the loggia. One is the bat, and the other one is the lion, both in the male and female versions. So let's go. These are, as you see, all, all birds. They are painted in, in the sprandel. All of them are painted, and they play an important role. And in the journate of the painting in the spradel, they were the last one to be painted after the figures. The figures in the sprandels are the putti with the arm of some gold from the Olympus. This is a griffon, another mythological animal. And then bird, you see, this is a, the second mama, which is a lioness, as you can see. Again, many of birds, again. This is quite interesting. It's a, an insect, as you can see, a butterfly. But it's a, a butterfly belonging to the Vanessa Io species. You say, how is possible to identify? If you enlarge, you see clearly, compared with the images, that this a butterfly belonging to the Vanessa Io species. And so on and so forth. So it's possible, as I show, to navigate and to see all the most important species in, into the, into the uh, loggia. I finished to navigate and now I pass to you. I would like to turn to Marco and maybe also you to tell us a little bit about the uh, color. Yeah. What type yeah. of color? And Marco, go ahead. Yeah, and, and we indeed we we've also had questions in the in the chat about uh, there's a lot of interest in the in the scientific analysis. The that's one of the things I'm I don't know about our um, how familiar people are with the um, scientific analysis of works of art. So how Antonio can say there is azurite, which is a copper mineral. There is, um, you would say there's cinnabar or other minerals. How do you do that when mostly scientific analysis is something that happens in a laboratory, but here we have a huge space in the middle of Rome. Um, even though it's across from the National Academy of Science, uh, it's far from, uh, from laboratory. So, what you need to do is to um, kind of go after what Raphael did and you, you set up a scaffolding, you get up close to the fresco and, um, and you bring uh, scientific instruments. Now, it so happens, um, you know, I, I work at the Metropolitan Museum. Everybody know what's happening right now in the, um, all over the world. We've been, we've been closed for uh, 10 weeks already. And so as a scientist, um, I don't have anything to do at home. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing reports and writing articles and doing webinars, but actually I did bring home my instruments with me. So what I have here is this little thing here, which would look like one of those very old uh, telephones that you used before, uh, <laughs> before telephones were like this. Um, this is uh, a spectrometer. This is a, it's called a Raman spectrometer. A, it has a laser beam that comes out of this side. And as the laser beam is reflected, um, very much like a laser pointer, but fancier and more expensive, by the paint, um, we collect um, a, a spectrum. We collect the, the, the very, a very analytical representation of, of what happens um, using a very particular effect. And, and Antonio will talk about what the different things, the different effects that we can use are. But this is the kind of instrument that you can set on a tripod and, and like this, if I wanted to analyze my Chinese painting here, um, we can do that analysis. And um, it, it's been the revolution in our field. Um, I have it at home because I'm still working. Um, I, I try to do some work 
from here. Um, and likewise, here in New York, we do not have um, 16th century frescoes, but we do have um, works of art in Central Park. We have, uh, we have sculptures there, and my staff go there um, and work with the Central Park Conservancy to um, assist in conservation of outdoor sculpture. We work with the other museums in New York City to, um, who don't have laboratories like we do. And, and, and very often we bring our own instruments in uh, little pelican cases to, to this type of work. It's, um, it's a fascinating um, effort when, when you take your instruments out of the lab and go um, in, uh, directly into a, into a collection, into a gallery, uh, a monument, an archaeological site um, like here. The, and then before turning over again to, to Antonio, unless the, the, one of the things I want to say is that it, it's really important to, um, to give credit to Antonio and his group at the University of Perugia because they really did um, some amazing work. They, years ago, it's like 15 years ago, they created a project called MoLab for Mobile Laboratory. And um, they, they got the best acronyms. They really like have a lock on every acronym that, uh, that, that identifies a project. But MOLAB was a, um, a collection of portable instruments loaded up in a van. And Antonio and his team started driving across Europe because this project was funded by the European Union to analyze works of art in great museums, uh, in monasteries in Greece, uh, faraway places. And, and uh, I have to steal the joke that Antonio told me. It's like when I, how, I said, how do you pick your students? And he said, we asked them if they have a driving license. If they have a driving license, they're on board because we move around a lot. Uh, and, and, and so maybe, Antonio, you want to, do you want to, how, what was exactly the, the analytical campaign? How long did it take to study yeah. these works? And, yes. and before... There are some questions. I know we're, we're going to talk about the details of the analysis, but um, we're getting a lot of questions on the on the side chat about the results. So if you don't yeah. say the things, I'll, I'll, I'll remind yeah, I, you. Yeah, I just want to, I have a PowerPoint. I want just to see if it's working, and then otherwise I will talk. And somebody asked me if we use, we do use X-ray fluorescence. And I want to say we, we use a combination. Yes. This, this one is a Raman spectrometer. Antonio used a lot that technique, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, another uh, big change in our field, and you see examples in this uh, PowerPoint, is um, imaging analysis, where we don't just go to a point and, and say what pigment is here, but we can um, associate that information with the, with the full image, which is invaluable. And then I'll shut up, Antonio. I'll let you. Yeah, talk. yeah. Can you see the image now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a, a non-invasive in situ campaign. It was quite interesting because uh, we were heavily using the X-ray fluorescence mapping, and this is the instrument. It's not so easy to work at eight meters with a surface which is not planar. So this instrument has to be adjusted due to the difference in the convexity of the, of the world. And this was done by the, the Brooker people. Actually, at that time, they were the spin-off of the Milan Unit Polytechnic, the XG Lab. So this is the instrument. Which are the, uh, I want just to show, I was talking about the, second pentimento on the ear of the series. And you see, you can see this ear, which was not anymore in the visible images. But which are the most important results that we got? Uh, Raphael used, I would say for the first time in the fresco, some artificial yellow, which are based on lead, tin, and antimony. There are several of these, and he was using most of them. For instance, in this mellow, the 
brightest part is due to the yellow components containing, as you can see, I don't have time to explain, but these are the maps, it's a very fluorescent map, containing lead, tin, and antimony. For instance, you see, this is one of the images of cherries and quinches. They are beautiful cherries, and but they are made by earth, red earth, which is very comfortable in the Afrisco technique. But then there is some light, you can see some more darker red made, made by vermilion, which was painted in a seco and probably had some deterioration. These two quinces are very beautiful. They are a different uh, gray degree of maturation. This is a rip, and again, he used the Naples yellow, which is a lead and antimony compound without having tin. In the time, tin was substituted by antimony. And then in the other one, more mature queens, he used a different composition. He used a yellow oak, and then there is some in light, you can see here, which, which are due to, again, to some artificial yellow. Artificial yellow were already known coming from the ceramic and glass manufacturing, but probably this is one of the first kind of application in fresco. They became a quite usual later on in the 17th century, but not in the Renaissance time. Another quite interesting aspect, he was using Sinada in the crystalline form, which is, as we know, red and can degradate, but it used also a kind of amorphous meta similar to simulate, for instance, the color in this case is a gray bluish. For instance, in the helmet of Mercury, he used meta similar just in order to simulate the metallic effects and so on. So there are several interesting pigments. Also because uh, Giovanni da Udine, who was painting the fruits and vegetables, had the problems. He has to paint some of the fruits that he knew because they are part of the collection of Agostino Figi, but the visitor did not know because they were coming from all over the world, Mexico included, just few years after the discovery of the new world. So he had the problem to use particular pigments to describe correctly the tonality of these fruits. For instance, I say that in the festoons, they first put a black banda just in order to emerge the tonality of the fruit and vegetable that were painted in the festoons. There are several interesting tricks that appear when you study very closely the, 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 the affresco by Raphael's. And some more interesting results we are going to, to present in the Galatea. But as I said, this will be an exhibition. The title will be Raphael in Villa Farnesina, Galatea in Saito, which will be open the 6th of October. It was supposed to be open the 6th of May, but you, to Epidemia, we have to postpone. So, as a, an anticipation in a way, we present the logical digital 
We Somebody asked work. about uh, the, um, again, how the fresco works. And what I was answering is that the, um, and, and whether some pigments react with the fresco. And, and what I was saying is that it's, it's really almost a, a, a mechanical, a crystallization effect where the lime plaster um, absorbs CO2, becomes calcium carbonate. And in doing that, it kind of like crystallizes around like, like ice forming around the particles of pigment that remain embedded in this layer. So actually the most important quality that you're looking for in a pigment and that Renaissance um, artists knew about because they could read it in, in, in their teaching manuals was that the pigment did not react with, with the paint, with the, with the fresco. In fact, they knew that some uh, materials that would work perfectly in tempera or in, um, in illumination should not be used with fresco. And typically those are uh, minerals that react to alkali because lime plaster is, is, is an alkali, it's, it's lime. And, um, or, or some organic materials that would be um, you know, destroyed by the uh, alkalinity of the fresco. Um, and um, and um, so and somebody also asked about the difficulty in doing these uh, analytical work. So, and, and, I, and I just like just going back to what Antonio said, that's why one combines different techniques. So um, I'm, you know, you, you may have a campaign of an imaging campaign using fluorescent light, uh, UV fluorescence, for instance, where you can see, uh, you know, the different contrast of different elements. So you can um, hone in your, your analysis and then using techniques that are based on X-rays, infrared, um, uh, reflectance spectroscopy, Raman, you try to build a, a case coming at many angles where everything will, um, will work. And, and typically the, the use of X-rays is the first thing we do um, with instruments that emit very, very small amount of x-ray, so they're safe for the user and for everybody around. Um, and, and that gives us the ballpark. You, you will see ver, uh, mercury tells you vermilion, lead may tell you a couple of different pigments. Um, we come in with techniques that have a more refined, more specific molecular response, such as infrared Raman, and we can um, get a little bit more of the detail um, that way. Antonio, I want to get back to you. There are, um, there's also the question of the deterioration of the fresco. Uh, you're muted, Antonio. The scan, because as you say, it was first of all made with a layer which is very comfortable with the fresco technique, which is small. Small is a, 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 a some silicone glass colored in blue by uh, cobalt anions, but they, have, they do not have a very intensive color. And they are very, very, very compatible with the plaster environment, which is basic, as you know, and with the humidity. But then to make a, a much more a, a, a blue sky, he used azurite. Azurite is a copper carbonate, basic carbonate, and it is not compatible with the Afresco technique. So he used at seco, and this deteriorate quite easily in different, different components, malachite, copper chloride, but more dangerous, thin or rare, uh, oxide of copper, thin, thin or rare, thin or rare, which is black. So the sky became black after a few years. So there was a big problem, how to solve this problem. And there was a, a very interesting restoration made by Carlo Maratti in uh, 1996, 1696, which has to afford this problem. What he did, he scraped out the black and 
he reused some uh, smalt, but with more intense color. He, he was a very, he was a very early restoration, but, but very well done from the philological point of view. He used already the concept of reversibility. So he used just compatible pigment and if he had to, to do some repainting, he used lapis and pastels, which can be easily removed. He was very controversial because Marathi was a painter. And the people say, he's going to paint again the beauty for Raphael at Fisk. But he was very conscious of this problem. He had also to face another big problem, adhesion, instability of the different layer, of moral and painting layer. And he used, I would say, a quite invasive method, but it was the only solution to solve the problem. He inserts something like 850 80, iron grappas, grappas, which is quite long, 12 centimeters, with the shape of a capital L or T. But they save the addition of the alfresco. And if you can still admire and see this alfresco, it's due to the beautiful work by Marathi in the end of the 17th century. So, so this to clarify, Antonio, it's, it's a phenomenon where the fresco layer would delaminate and you, you create yes. like a bubble or a, or a cavity in between the wall with its coarser plaster and, and the fine plaster and eventually spall and, and fall. So Yeah, because Villa Farnesina had many problems. It's nearby the Tiber. So he suffered from, from the flood of Tiber. And after a big flood in 1870, he was decided to build the so-called bank wall of Tiber, destroying most of the part of the garden of the Villa Parmesina, because the Tiber was coming into the garden. And there were also problems due to the the, the, the road just passing next to it, craft road and so on. So there were many problems, but they were very clearly solved in, in the past. So the villa is still in very good conditions. And right now the, um, the, the key element is that the it's it's the loggia has been stabilized with the with the environmental yes. control with the windows you you lost i mean it, it lost a little bit the fact that you would yeah, be yeah, yeah that it, there would it, be these or small this penetration between permeation between it, outside and inside but you you lost the initial idea of uh, uh, Raphael to have the continuity between garden and the inside of loggia I mean, you saved the lodge. Yeah. And, and the garden would have led directly to the bank of the river, correct? Yes, that was, yes. That was now the... we, have a, we have a garden, but not so large on the north side, but on the south side. There is still a very beautiful garden, mm -hmm. the Italian type of garden. We have, the, for instance, 25 different types of uh, orange, in the garden, and there are very unusual fruits and so on. Not so beautiful as the, those painted by Giovanni da Udine, but still alive fruits in the garden. Uh, Antonio, I, I, I'm seeing, uh, and I don't know, Paolo, do we have time for? Um, yes. I'm, I'm reading some of the questions, really uh, fascinating. Um, there's a request to know if you have articles on these. Uh, so there's been public articles that were published or accessible through the website on this work? Uh, yes, there is a, a small catalog of the exhibition that we did uh, three years ago. And this is still available in Italian and English. We publish a few papers. And we are going to publish a new catalog for the exhibition of the 
6th of October. The catalog is in preparation for both the lodge Galatea and Psyche, Cupid and Psyche lodge. And, and then another... there are some papers in the current literature, scientific okay. literature. And, and this is uh, I Colori della Prosperità, correct? Yes. The, so, so you the, can say in English, the color, because it's uh, the English edition of the catalog. I know that you have the Italian one, but. And, and in English I, it is. The, there is the catalog also in English, but uh, the, the experience of the research in uh, in Villa Farnesina was a very interesting project because it was a collaboration between different institutions. National Institute, the CNR was involved, the, N the ENEA, NEA was involved, which are public institutions, but also private society, like the Brooker was involved, and also a regional laboratory for diagnostic in Spoleto, in Umbria, which is, which is specialized for the, the earth problems, earthquake problems on cultural heritage, but is working on the diagnostic. So it was a, a quite interesting collaboration between private and public institutions, which works quite well. And also a very nice collaboration between, among different professionals, scientists, art historian, informatics, and so on and so forth. Was a, was a, is still a very good experience. And of course, uh, uh, Villa Farmesina is a workshop, always uh, with problems, because uh, you solve some problems, but some other problems arise, we have plenty of uh, affresco from all the century. Also very beautiful affresco for the 17th century by Gaspar Luque, which are in the loggia of Galatea. And then we have some Sodoma affresco in the, in the first floor. And then also 19th century affresco on Pompeian style, which are very interesting. So there is a, a, a complete range of different uh, typology of a fresco, and they deserve care. So it's a, an interesting uh, workshop, Villa Patnesina as well, from, also from the diagnostic point of view and from the restoration point of view. There is a, a question that I think I should answer. Somebody asked whether Villa Farnesina is the seat of the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs. And no, 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 sorry. no, sorry. No, 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 let, let me answer. Let, yes, yes, I, you have, I'm, I'm, I am part of the yeah, Farnesina yeah. Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So they, they both have to do with the Farnese family, but the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was built in a completely different part of the city of Rome to the north um, in a place where there they, they, they were gardens named after the, fa the Farnese family. And that's why it's called now Farnesina. Yeah, but if I can add something, there is a, a, another very important Farnese palace on the other river of the site. Because the Farnesina, which means small Farnese, was sold by Kiji family in 1580 to Alessandro Farnese, who was the owner of the villa of the, the Palazzo Farnese on the other side, which nowadays is the location of the French embassy. There was also a plan to make a bridge between the two Farnese, the Farnese Palace and the small Farnesina. This is why, although he was the residence of Agostino Chigi is called Farnesina, the small building belonging to the Farnese family. Other questions about the cartons. Uh, did Raphael always use cartons 
and and have they survived? No, we have drawings. I mean, we have sketched drawings and also many, many drawings after Raphael. Because uh, Villa uh, Agnesina was also the location of some students in the past. So it was a place where students were going to, to reproduce the fresco and so on. There are, there are no original cartoons, but there are many drawings, some from Raphael and from the workshop and some other after Raphael's by later artists in the century. Was very, very much reproduced by incisions uh, and so on and so forth. All the painting in Villa Farnesina. And uh, some of the beautiful drawings are in the Metropolitan Museum, you see, coming from Villa Farnesina at his uh, Antonio, there's a question about uh, whether infrared reflectography would show uh, pouncing. Uh, no, no, but I mean, uh, you can easily, uh, together with the restorers and so on, you can easily using a radar device to feed the, the pouncing technique and so on. So yeah. there are a lot of uh, evidences. But, and you know, I think the, pro the problem is also that uh, for infrared reflectography, you need, you know, the, it works by having, using infrared light, which, which travels farther yeah, into a it's, pane it's because it's not scattered, it's, but calcium carbonate scatters yeah. a lot, which yeah. makes me think another, you know, one of the things I've, I've been working a lot, um, so I'm working a lot on, Jap on Japanese prints, and, yeah. but, but it, it, when you, uh, when I'm not an artist, uh, and I shouldn't even try to reproduce uh, frescoes or others. But one of the things that's always amazing to me, thinking as a non-artist, is that it's, it's a little bit like painting uh, porcelain or painting ceramic. The artist does not see when he or she is painting the yes, final result. Because uh, as, you, as you do fresco, because of the wet plaster, if it's glossier, it's more, it's somewhat translucent, then it will um, dry into something that's very high, uh, very matte, very light scattering. So you have to think about what the end result uh, is. And the same with, with, uh, with Japanese prints, where essentially the printer is printing on a piece of wood, not on a piece of paper. It's painting on a piece of wood, not on a piece of paper. Yeah. And, and so there is this amazing mental gymnastic that the artist does um, in, in anticipating what the result. And I think that this is also where the school is important, yeah. the technique, yeah. uh, really going through uh, um, uh, a rule book that allows you to, to extrapolate and see what will be uh, yeah. in the future, and, what you're doing. And from this point of view, Raphael was a very good master. I mean, can you imagine 305 giornate of a fresco without any tintinit and so on. Just a, a couple of small adjustments. This is, means that he had in his mind a perfect plan of the Afrisco, of the results that he wanted. In, uh, remember that he was working in, diff in different places. He was uh, heavily involved in the Vatican. And after the war, after all, he was also involved in a very love affair with Fornarina. You know that was living 50 meters from the Villa Farnese. So it was very, very uh, heavily involved in work, love, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And Villa Farnesina was a, a central point. There was a special uh, uh, bonding with Agostino Chigi. You know that Agostino Chigi died five days after Raphael. This is incredible. I mean, the same year, the same month, in just less than a week ago. They have a similar story from, from this point of view. The, 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 this is very intriguing. 
Also, Agostino Chigi, the great banker, was a, a real, a very important personage within the, the Pope court, Julius II, Alexander, Leon the Ten, and so on. So what, um, so what, what would Rome have been at that time? Before, before the, before the, before the Lanzichenecchi, before the, the sack of Rome and before the invasion. Yeah. And the, the sack of Rome just happened less than 10 years after complete, completing Villa Farnese. Can you imagine that beautiful villa that became the camp of Lanzichenecchi? Just less than because it was 1527, the completion of the villa was 1519. So less than uh, 10 years, it became a camp of a- uh, So the invading Nazi army Nazi. actually uh, established itself there? Yes, there was a camp inside. I mean, they were sleeping, eating, and doing everything inside, like a, a military camp. So it's- uh, in a way, a and, the, and the frescoes survive? No, no graffiti, no. No, there, there are just a couple of graffiti with bad words written in very uh, German characteristic characters saying that the, the, we fight the Pope, we won, and so on. And they are still there in the in the fresco in the first floor. They are. Great. A historical graffiti now, I mean, so they remain just as part of the Afrisco. Okay, I have a last question for Marco regarding uh, uh, scientific research in general. Uh, uh, Italy has, has a long tradition of excellence in, in, in restoration and in uh, uh, teaching restoration as well in schools. Uh, how are we, how is Italy doing with, with technology? Are we at the avant-garde? Are we, are we at the forefront of research? And if yes, is that why there are so many Italians at the Met doing this kind of job, including um, yourself? Um, well, it, in reality, yes. I mean, it, I would say um, it, it's really a phenomenon that happened in Europe in the last uh, maybe 30 years where the European Union um, put significant funding into uh, preservation of cultural heritage. And they, they realized that um, cultural heritage, monuments, art, museums is an asset of Europe. The people go there, not just for the beaches and the good food, but to really see uh, the, the cultural and artistic treasures. And the, uh, the European Union having dedicated, dedicated funding, they really tailor them to research. And, and so the universities in Italy, in, in the Netherlands, in France, UK, they were um, very um, quick and I think visionary in aligning, aligning with these <coughs> trends. And so you have um, this phenomenon where you have fantastic scientists and research groups who are doing work in chemistry, geology, the biological sciences. And they started working in cultural heritage, um, and and when you have people like Antonio, not not just because not because he's a friend, but because I, I know exactly how he thinks, um, you have this passion, but backed by really strong science, and and they they built a system, and so um, quite quite simply, what happens when we look for candidates for um, for jobs in the sciences in um, in the US, we, we find a lot of applicants from Italy who are really, um, really very talented. And this is not to say that we don't uh, have people equally talented from other countries, but the numbers are such. And to be frank about some of the problems that Italy has, Italy is better at training people than at giving them jobs. And the US um, historically has been in the position of giving jobs um, and having the luxury of not needing to bother too much about training at times. Uh, don't get me wrong, U.S. is a powerhouse in, in, in research, but for instance, there's no federal funding mechanism that will support uh, the work that we do in museums. So science for cultural heritage is 80% um, in museums in the, U, in, in the U.S. We're, we're seeing now uh, a lot of fantastic academic 
colleagues um, really being involved, uh, but we, we're still um, just um, a fraction of, of the funding uh, budget for, for the hard sciences, for material science, for polymer research. So that, that is why you have such a strength. And I would say probably um, the forefront of research in cultural heritage is in, um, in Europe, even though we have great research here. It's just a matter of numbers. Um, what we have that I find um, really interesting, and, and I encourage all of our um, listeners to, to look at our website to, to keep an eye out because very soon we'll, we'll have, as soon as we reopen, which we can't wait for that, um, we really plan to bring more and more of the science in the galleries. So you can see some of the work that Antonio mentioned, you'll see it um, in the galleries of the Met. And so the strength of the US system is that science for cultural heritage is really in museums. And so we have a dialogue with the conservators curator, which is um, a daily dialogue and, and it's really applied. So there's, there's always um, these interface with the work of art. Um, it's really important, but it's, it, it, there's also a, a great collaboration international with, uh, with laboratories in Italy, in uh, all over Europe and Asia. So it, it, it's a very vibrant sector, um, which we, we, we truly hope to bring more um, to the public, but uh, um, the, the new generation of curators and museum directors is really attuned to these uh, needs. Well, I do, I do hope that we as, uh, you know, Italian cultural institutes uh, uh, in the US and in Canada can, I hope we can do something about this to uh, facilitate and to help and to bring to the public all the, all the beautiful work that, that you're doing. Uh, and with this, I, uh, um, um, I want to thank uh, Antonio and Marco for being with us, for giving us their uh, thoughts about uh, Raphael and uh, telling us about their work. Uh, again, uh, apologies about the technical difficulties, um, but I, I hope that uh, uh, the message was carried through. Uh, stay tuned for more webinars about uh, uh, Raphael and um, uh, follow us on, on our social for, for more events and hopefully in the fall we'll be opening again to uh, real events in, uh, in phys with physical presence as, as uh, we're present. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. Buonanotte, Antonio. Buonanotte. Buon pomeriggio. <laughs> thank you to all the participants. Thank you, thank Paolo. You, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Paolo, again. Okay.